And we're live. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another photo mishmash. This one being broadcast live December 19th, 2018. And as usual, I'm joined by my good friend, Steve Skirch, co-host and friend. And uh, you've got a new addition. Uh, we've got a co-co-host today, Steve. Yeah, we've got a co-co-host. You need Archer on your side, but this is this is little Ollie here. Say hi, Ollie. Oh, Ollie, you are so, so cute. <laughs> Steve, you just got her like three days ago? No, we just picked her up yesterday. Yesterday. Uh, yeah, oh, that's yesterday right. afternoon. Yep. We met her about a month ago, a uh, little squirmy girl. And um, we met her a month ago and knew that we were going to pick her up on the 18th. We were, we had some friends. We had a lot going on last weekend. We had some friends in town. And then we all went to Nashville and went to a concert. And the next day, got up and uh, went and picked her up and brought her home. So, yeah. That's and we insane. were talking uh, off air just before we logged on. And I actually got, well, she got a great night's sleep last night. She went to sleep <laughs> at 10.15 and woke up at 7.15, slept in my arms, which she's getting crate trained, but I uh, kind of caved last night. And um, I didn't sleep well because I was constantly worried how she was doing, but she was fine. So. <laughs> Yeah, so if any if you've anybody tuned in for anything other than cute puppy cam, uh, just stop <laughs> just stop watching because this is just going to be the Ollie show. Yeah, yeah, we'll uh, we'll see what happens with this little one. I'm, I'm thinking an airstream in the future and mm -hmm. uh, do some photography out there and take this little girl along and uh, call it Ollie's travels. Um, and we'll uh, we'll see if that's going to be official. What do you think, girl? I like it. I'll buy that coffee table book. <laughs> or, or subscribe to that YouTube channel. However, you put that out, I will. Yeah, um, I'll uh, I'll have her sign off, and then I'm gonna go give her to mommy. Say okay. Bye. Bye, 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 Ollie. Come come visit Seattle sometime soon. Yeah, go see Uncle Toby. All okay. right. So this is this weekly show where Steve and I get together and chit chat about anything that we like to talk about. Usually photography related. Sometimes puppy related. When there's a puppy that cute, um, in his house. So uh, thanks for introducing us, Steve. Uh, we got a couple of things we're going to just kind of dive into this show. There's a lot. You know, each week, I think, Steve, you and I went for like 90 minutes last week. We like to chit chat about stuff. We love chatting with the chat room, which uh, thank you all for hanging out with us today. We've got new gear on the table. We've got gear that's been on the table for a little bit longer that I want to talk more about. Um, but the first thing I want to share, and Roy, too, we both made big purchases in the last few days. Mine was just a few hours ago. Oh, I know what it is. You haven't right. told me, but I'm guessing it's the 100 to 400. Yep. That's right. Nice. Yeah. Um, awesome. And I thank you. Thank you. I did buy it with the, uh, so this is the Sony 100 to 400. Um, and I did buy it with the one four teleconverter. I thought one of the perks of this job is getting to borrow gear fairly regularly, but I certainly don't like to abuse that. And I borrowed that 1.4 extender twice now. Um, and you know, if I'm using it that much, then I should own it. And so I'm really excited about the setup. I do love to do a little bit of wildlife photography from time to time on my own, plus these opportunities the big one coming up, Antarctica. Um, I just, I want it to be my gear. I want to be comfortable with it. And um, I'm really excited about this. So uh, is that, that's the same setup that you used when we did the Arctic in June, right? Yes. You have Sony 100 to 400 with the 1.4 teleconverter. That's right. Because I remember um, looking at a lot of your images, especially the first polar bears that we saw where you really had to zoom in tight. And we were all, uh, you know, kind of comparing, okay, with the teleconverter without. And the image quality that you were getting was outstanding with that setup. So that's was, awesome. Yeah, I was pretty, pretty happy with that setup. Um, and I'm pretty happy with how slow I can handhold it, too. It, you know, this is, of course, subject dependent. That's a Tuesday tip I put out recently. But, um, you know, I can handhold it a lot slower than I thought I'd be able to and still get sharp shots. So it's it's a great Great setup. Roy has picked up the 70 to 200 F 28 G master, which is a oh. fantastic lens. And he's actually paired that with a one four teleconverter, which gives you some nice flexibility. You're starting to get into that range of certainly decent enough wildlife photography. Um, and of course you have a, an unbelievable portrait lens as well. Yeah, that's wow. That's awesome. And um, talk about a staple lens that everybody should have in their bag. Uh, as they start to really get good gear, you know, and they want to buy multiple lenses. 
Um, I mean, having a good all around walking lens, like a 24 to 105 range is, is super ideal as your first good piece of glass for your setup. But right behind that, I'd say the 70 to 200, because it's still uh, my favorite lens that I have, despite having many, many lenses now in the Canon lineup. Mm -hmm. um, that 70 to 200 is still my all time favorite. Yeah. 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 Uh, yep. I love that lens. Um, let me ask you, Steve, a little personal chit chat for a moment. You went to Antarctica last time. I did not. You, uh -huh. um, what, remind me what wider focal lengths you brought and how often you were using. Yeah. So I, I just brought two lenses down there. I brought my 100 to 400. I did not bring a teleconverter. I'm typically not a fan. I had used a 2X converter on the Tanzania trip and I didn't like it at all. So for Antarctica, I didn't use it. Uh, for the Arctic, I brought a 1.4 X, um, and it was the newest. I think it's a version three for Canon and it was much better than the two X, but it's still it just, it was a little soft. Um, so anyway, for Antarctica, I just had the 100 to 400 lens, which I bought right before the trip. Um, because like you, you know, I like to get out and shoot wildlife on my own. And I found that I had rented it, um, well, I had used, <laughs> rented it as a loose word because I was working at Sammy's camera, but I had used that lens when I went to Tanzania and then I had rented it on a couple other trips and I thought, this is silly. I need to just buy this lens. So I had the 100 to 400 and then for a wide angle, I had my 24 to 70 Canon and that's the version two. Uh, and I was really happy with what I brought. Um, I brought a tripod, but I never used it. In fact, I was testing that Mi Photo um, the really light one air, the me photo mm -hmm. air tripod, yeah, yeah, yeah. um, never even came, came out of the bag. Now it might be different for you guys. Cause you have a little bit more time there. And I know one night the plan is to camp on the yeah. continent. And if you do that, then you've got stable ground and you can use that tripod, yeah. um, you know, for scenic shots and stuff, but yeah. 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 I, I, I probably will bring a tripod for you know time-lapse, uh, yeah. those options, but I, yeah, I don't see myself using it a lot. I don't think I used one for anything on the Arctic trip other than time-lapse. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If there's ever a place to do time-lapse, it's Antarctica. I mean, yeah. what you get there is just phenomenal and the way the light changes on mm. the icebergs and stuff is just incredible. I'm, yeah. Oh, super jealous. I'm not going. <laughs> Your decision. Um, I know. I know. <laughs> one one thing that I'm struggling with is I've got my Tamron 28 to 75, but I think I want to bring a 16 to 35 because um, we'll talk about this in a second. I, I my Altex waterproof housing review. I think that is new since last show, or maybe it went out right before last show. Um, I'm going to pick up the dome for it. Uh, which lets oh, you, you get are. those cool. split horizon shots. Now I'm picking up the dome version that screws in, not the one that Adam used and had a bad experience with. Um, so mine attaches differently. Um, yeah. And that's because I'm going to use it with a lens with filters. Adam was putting it on a lens that uh, didn't. Um, I talked to the Altex guys yesterday, JR, the CEO of Altex. He called um, me, want to talk a little bit about my thoughts in that video and my thoughts after using the product for six months. He says he's they've already addressed some of my issues. Um, he didn't really have an answer for what went wrong with Adam, um, you know, so I'm not, I'm not sure about that, but the tripod socket issue, but anyway, so I'm going to, I think, take a dome with me that lets you get those split horizon shots above and below water. I would love to get one of the icebergs, you know, the blue depths descending into the water and then the yeah. low iceberg above that, that would be spectacular. So I now, think that, um, good. I, I, I uh. I don't want to ignore what you have right in front of you on your desk. So I'm sure we're going to get to talking about that, mm -hmm. but, um, you have a, a hero seven that you can bring a GoPro. I could, I could. Yeah. Or in any GoPro. Cause yeah. uh, I, I was, I noticed a lot of people had GoPros on selfie sticks mm -hmm. and that was awesome because when you get by the whales and the seals underwater and stuff, you just dip that down underneath the Zodiac and some of the footage that some of these people were getting was was just awesome. Yeah. You'll probably be able to get that with um, the setup that you've got as well. But, you know, just for a real quick, just, you know, extend that selfie stick and dip it down in the water was awfully, uh, 
awfully cool. Yeah, it de it's very appealing. Um, and there's a couple of options. So let's let's kind of move on a little bit from that. I'm definitely thinking about GoPros. This little guy that arrived last night is the Pocket Osmo. It is tiny, has got a nice little heft to it, but it is very small. I mean, it's you know only slightly longer than a GoPro and of course skinnier. Um, and so far, I'm impressed. Like I said, it arrived last night, so I've had really about half an hour of kind of playing with it. I just turned it on, so it should look like the head is acting mm -hmm. kind of stable, and it gets plugged into a camera via the little USB if you want a bigger screen, and then you can do more stuff to it. Um, so that's all good. I like that. I'm pretty excited about it. I am. I knew this was an issue, um, but you know, just thinking about it more, uh, there's no tripod socket. You've got a little charging port oh, down here. I was wondering if there was or not, because um, I was just about to click the buy button on that thing, and I had this this moment of just thinking, like, you know, it's three hundred and fifty dollars that I could really apply to something else, or it's Christmas time. I don't need to be doing this, which was the right decision. But uh, I'm uh, I'm really intrigued by that product. Yeah, and I was curious if there was a tripod screwing at the bottom. I'm kind of surprised. I I'm pretty sure they sell an accessory or two, and this is kind of why I wanted to lead into this. Uh, I think they sell an accessory or two that does give you that option. And another thought I had is, well, when it's attached to the camera, I have, uh, or sorry, when it's attached to the phone, I've got mounts that could hold the phone. You know, that's not necessarily the best uh, because it's in there, but it's not the same as being secured to a tripod. Yeah. Um, and, uh, well, the, yeah, they have those uh, bits that you can attach it to. Uh, and, and what I'm thinking, maybe if I like this enough, they have a waterproof housing for it too. Maybe that should go with me to Antarctica. Um, oh, and, that would be cool. um, that's what we'll use. I don't know. So, um, I'll have lots more to say about this cause my guy who helps me with the video and you, you've seen on some. Uh, videos in the past. He really wants to get his hands on this for um, kind of B-roll shots uh, that will spice up our videos a bit. Uh, you can always, you know, use the bigger gimbals. I got the DJI Ronin S in there. I've taken that with me on trips, but the setup time of those is just, it's long mm -hmm. and it just doesn't work well for your shooting. Okay. We need 30 second clip of this. And it takes you yeah. two minutes to get that all set up and you use it. Then you take it down. It really slows down your production. Well, They're especially as you now know, uh, after the Arctic trip, you're, um, you're traipsing around in all of these, the big bulky jacket and uh, life vest on top of that and your gloves and hats and, you know, glasses and all yeah. this stuff. And it's just like the, the more you can take something like that, the better, um, yeah. you know, it's just going to be a, a lot easier on you. So. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. No, def simplification is is key. And that's the one of the things, you know, I have in mind to get this half glacial, you know, iceberg shot above and below water. But it, it's quite tricky to, you know, find a spot in the Zodiac, lean over, get it below the surface of the water enough. You're wearing bulky gears. It's wet. It's cold. There might be waves. So it might be a kind of like a pie in the sky dream. But, you know, it's a goal of mine. And I can certainly see where GoPros and things on selfie sticks where you can just be like boom, into the yeah. water. Yeah. You know, that ease of use factor is, is huge. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. So more about this later. And, you know, I, I flew this on the show last week and here it still is still working. I want let's let's <laughs> let's tease this maybe a little bit later in the show. I'll see what its lifting capabilities is. What if you could? I don't think so. This has some heft to it, but I got some rubber bands on here. I haven't tried it yet, <laughs> but let's just see. Nice. Keep oh, watching. Like Hit that thumbs up. One, if Ollie was cute. Ollie was Steve's dog. If you're just joining us now, you missed oh, it. You'll have up. to go back. And of course, a uh, thumbs up if you want us to see uh, this. <laughs> Try this. So right. I, I need to, uh, before I forget, I need to give a shout out. Uh, well, two things I need to address. Number one, for those of you who can tell, I don't know if you can even see this, but I noticed it when I was testing my, um, my camera earlier. I burst in a vessel in my eyeball. Yeah, see that. Right eye, and it is nasty looking. So I'm okay. Just so you people aren't like, who's this? True. I was worried about you. I thought maybe Ollie yeah. peed in it or something. You <laughs> yeah. just didn't want to talk I about it. I don't even know what happened. I was, um, uh, I did have an eyelash in that eye the day before it happened. And I fished that out. 
And then that night I was actually uh, preparing my father's uh, Christmas gift, which is a photograph. And I ordered a metal print mm -hmm. of it and stuff. And so I was really strained on my computer. And uh, anyway, I woke up the next morning and it looked terrible. <laughs> um, so anyway, it's healing. It's like, believe it or not, this is like 70% better than it was. I look like a James Bond, uh, um, like a bad guy in a James Bond film. A little bit. Yeah, Bill. a little bit. Maybe you should, but you're scaring me. Put some sunglasses on. Or something. <laughs> so I wanted to address that just in case people are like, this is my first time tuning in. You got this dude with a bloody eye. Um, the other thing, though, more much more importantly, is I need to give a really heartfelt thanks and shout out to Roy for my Christmas present. You guys can see it. It says McKay Photography Academy. And it says Photo Enthusiast Network. And this is a Yeti. And I say Yeti because I have wanted a Yeti cup like this, no kidding, for years. And for whatever reason, I've never gotten one. We're big fans. We have a bunch of hydro flask and stuff in this house. So we use this kind of stuff. And um, Roy, I just wanted to tell you thank you um, publicly because this really meant a lot to me. I got home the other night and it was, uh, or last night, and it was waiting for me. And so thanks for that. Really Very appreciate nice. It. Very nice. Those are great. I love it. I love mine that Roy gave me last year. It's a fantastic present. Thank you, Roy. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I think uh, I saw yours and I was super jealous. So this mm. is mm -hmm. up with the Joneses here. Uh, Roy, you know, speaking of Roy, he mentions that there is a dog mount. I remember this now. There's a, a dog mount you can buy for this pocket Osmo, a uh, little harness, and then it can stick back there. And of course, you know, just in case anybody doesn't know, now that I've kind of Frankenstein this thing up, the little pocket Osmo is a tiny stabilized camera system. So it is a three axis gimbal that gives you really smooth cinematic footage, even when you're jumping and running around to a degree. There are certainly limits to these things, but it's it's really going to be interesting to put it up against something like the GoPro Hero 7, which has the electronic stabilization. Uh, I think they both have their pluses and minuses. Um, this comes in at a little cheaper, and because it does some of that motion time-lapse stuff for you, um, it's a little bit more appealing to me, to me than something like a GoPro. But as I said, they have their pluses and minuses. Yeah, yeah. It's funny. Um, I didn't know there was a dog mount to that. But when it first was uh, introduced, I knew that we were picking Ollie up. And I was like, if they don't have a dog mount for that thing, I'm going with GoPro. <laughs> uh, really you're sick. safe still. Yeah, good. All right. Um, we're, we're kind of in this week in review section of the show where we talk about some other things. A video that went out just uh, yesterday, I think. Um, I was a tip. It's actually, it had gone out to Penn members, but I want to share it with the wider world and also just use it as a little plug for Penn. Um, and that's how to move files, photos, and folders around inside Lightroom. I mean, Steve, you and I talk about this on our workshops when we're traveling often. If you're using Lightroom, you should kind of go all in. Don't, don't, you know, don't half-ass it for lack this, of better language. This analogy's gotten really weird on trips, by the way. It's just progressively getting worse. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We they talk about entering into a relationship with Lightroom, and you don't want to do any cheating. You don't want to do any moving files or folders or communication with those other things outside of Lightroom. Yeah. Uh, and so just real show you really simply how easy it is to move. And even more commonly, what, what a lot of you write or tell me is I've got a new hard drive. I plug it in, my computer sees it, but Lightroom doesn't see it. How do I move pictures and stuff to this new hard drive? And I show you exactly how to do that. It's very simple. The, the video is like five minutes long. Um, and uh, if you have any interest in that, you should go watch. But stay tuned in for a little bit later in the show. I'm going to give a hands-on demo. Luminar version 3 has just come out. I've got a copy with the new libraries function and feature. And I just want to kind of give you all a tour. Um, I've, I've played with it a little bit and I'll say one of its greatest strengths is that it can be a very easy program to use and it is way more affordable than Lightroom. Uh, yeah. you know, if you're only kind of doing photography from time to time. Yeah. Uh, and then there was a Tuesday tip this week. I have no idea what it was. Do you know what the Tuesday tip was this week? Uh, yeah, it was on, I said that and no, Why? I'm so buried on emails right now because I just got home last night and we've done nothing but puppy duty. 
So I understand. Maybe if you you look it up, I'll explain what Tuesday tips are. If you're watching the show, most of you are photo enthusiast members. Uh, the Photo Enthusiast Network is a fantastic community and resource for you to grow as a photographer. I talk a little bit more about it in that video that I just put out that shows you how to organize your files and folders inside Lightroom. Um, but one of the benefits that you get, just one of many, is a weekly email with tips, tricks, inspiration, things to think about across a variety of subjects. Uh, and uh, I'm really proud of the content and just reading through those, getting those delivered to your inbox each week, I think is a fantastic resource to kind of keep you motivated, keep you interested, keep you learning, keeping your brain fresh about photography. And um, if you join the Photo Enthusiast Network before the end of the year, you get grandfathered into our ridiculously introductory price, which we've just kind of finished up our first year of this business and it is going really well, I'm really happy with how it's going. And um, you can join just $9.99 a month, but if you buy for a year, it's just $8 a month, just eight bucks. It's a ridiculous price. You get locked in at that. Yeah, so, yeah. And uh, the Tuesday tip is on holiday lights. I remember that mm. actually, David said he was sending that out um, and it's great. So it's, it's not just holiday lights like on your Christmas tree. It's, it's um, shooting night scenes and landscapes and stuff like that. Awesome areas. We used to do quite a bit a San Francisco uh, holiday lights tour. And we would take clients to San Francisco. We'd cruise around Ghirardelli Square and a bunch of different areas around Levi's Plaza. We'd get exclusive access to certain areas there and Treasure Island shooting back at the city. Um, it hasn't happened for, for quite a while. Squeezing it in has been tough, but... Um, anyway, there's a lot of reference to images from that and what the settings are, and it's a great Tuesday tip. So I, I definitely encourage you to see that. Um, so that's it. Yeah. Nice. Uh, and, um, your best photo of 2018. This is not necessarily a photo enthusiast network, though. I invite all of those members to participate. This is just kind of an annual tradition at photo Rec TV, where I ask you to pick your one most favorite image that you captured in 2018 and send it to me for our end of the year slideshow. Um, I like this one to see all of your pictures and two to force you to look back and kind of pick that one moment. I know for some people I've I asked and then the comments on the video and other people have reached out. For some of you, it's quite easy. There is a moment that clearly stands out. But for many of us, there's three or four or five pictures that we captured over the course of the year that we really really like i fall into that same category steve i think you've got a couple that you really like yeah there were a couple of them and i i'm still pretty set on the uh, polar bear one i just emailed you though um the photo rec toby um or photo rec tv uh the image that i did for my father for his christmas present and mm. although it's, it, it's not a photo that i took in 2018 but it's a picture that i just edited and um it's a pretty small file so it may i don't know how i got it it looks great um, you share this. that is one of my favorite pieces of work from the year and um i'm calling it reconciliation and there's a whole reason behind that title but this is uh this is basically just one photograph um of half of it and then i flipped it over and created this mirrored image and it just played real nicely all the way down to the mountain that appears right in between the two middle uh, pillars. Yeah, look at that. That Yeah, it, yeah. I, I was kind of, I wanted to make something real special for him and I was playing around with it the other night and I ended up spending hours putting this thing together. And um, anyway, it just, I was really, really happy with it. And that would probably go down as my favorite picture from last year that I made, but I didn't take it in 2018, so uh -huh. don't well, know how strict your rules are. <laughs> my my rules are supposed to be captured in 2018, but that you know that brings up an interesting an interesting point. Um, especially as our post processing skills grow, we talk about this a lot. One of the many reasons we say you should shoot in raw. Uh, because you might come back to an image that you took a few years ago, and you might have much better skills for editing, and that's a huge part of the display of the picture, of the finishing of the picture is that post-processing. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in one of our news articles. Um, you know, somebody trying to stir up a little controversy about photographers cheating. And yeah, you know, it's, some people think it's a gray area. If you're not photojournalist, well, we'll talk about it. 
<laughs> so um that's a fantastic image steve thanks for sharing but yeah, yeah so i'm excited lots of images have been pouring in i've got some work ahead of me to put those together all in the slideshow but it's one of my favorite um what's my, one of my favorite activities each year that i get to do is kind of share out everybody's favorite moments and see um yeah so that's good and uh just a reminder there will be no show next week because believe it or not next week will be after christmas already by this point wow we're less than That's a week from Christmas. Holy crap, people. <laughs> are you uh, are you ready for this, Toby? Uh, do you have your Christmas shopping done? Are you ready for the holiday? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. yeah. I think uh, I think we ordered something just about an hour ago. I think that was the last Christmas gift we had to do. So I think yeah. we're good. I, I have a, a couple more little things, little stocking stuffers and stuff like that. But um, But yeah, I'm ready. It's a good feeling. It is. Yeah. Uh, let's dive into the section of the show that we call Lightroom Tips and Tricks. It's where photo enthusiast members get to send in their photos and, and kind of hear our thoughts on the photo, but more importantly, see what we would do with it in Lightroom. Again, photo enthusiast members, remember you have tons of different ways to get your images critiqued from kind of informal, throw them in the group and say, hey, did I push the saturation too far or submit them to option one review in the forum where you actually get us to come in and kind of give you some feedback. And oftentimes we end up kind of doing some quick tweaks in, in Lightroom and showing you what we did either through video or kind of annotated screenshots or submitting them to the monthly image review where Steve, you and Ali sit down and critique these images uh, and pick a winner that wins fantastic prizes from Bay Photo. And occasionally David McKay's on the on the line with us. Is he? <laughs> you said, Steve, you and Allie sit down. No, yeah. <laughs> we, uh, we, we, like to, uh, we like to let David just kind of run the show, actually. Um, so I had to put that dig in there in case he watches this. Gotcha. Gotcha. <laughs> oh, All right. and, uh, Kevin, Kevin Locke brings up a point here, and I'm surprised, to be honest with you, mm. I didn't notice this until he brought it up, that your background has changed. No more yeah. psychedelic brick. No, well, it's right under that wood. But yeah, okay. that's right. I forgot about that. So this is the first live show where I've used the new backdrop. What do you think? Now, now do you have to use quotations when you say wood? Yeah. yeah. It looks good. I like it. Yeah, I'm pretty happy with it. Uh, being picky, you see this gray yep. Uh, yep. piece here. It ends right at my head. Yep. You know? yep. I was, so I was, was going to say something about that. If I come over here, it's a little bit better. How you yeah. doing? But uh, it's going uh, to be nice when we do our live show together when I come to visit you, though, because it'll like telepathically connect our heads. Mm, that's good. That's good. Yeah. I think we should split it. You should still be behind the fruity pebbles, as Brian Scanlon says in <laughs> chat. And I'll be behind the professional wood. Tonight, we're going to talk about photography. What's funny is we're going to watch some of your YouTube videos and there's going to be the section of like four different videos where you're like, oh, yeah, that was the uh, psychedelic uh, drug induced uh, wall days of uh, photo rec tv i i think it will be back for some i i like it enough i know it's a little it's a little crazy but for some videos i think it's it's gonna work i, I did it, it just you'll probably need, never see it again no it needs some good graffiti on there um mm. yeah mm -hmm. and maybe some bumper stickers or something yeah. yeah. All right. Let's dive into uh, Lightroom here where we've got some images submitted. If you'd like to submit images and see us work on them, well, become a Photo Enthusiast Network member and uh, we'll do that for you. Uh, we have the show almost every week, except when we take breaks for Christmas or travel. Uh, first up, we've got two images from Adam Beck. I believe it's the same image. Nope. It is two different ones. Um, and he is getting ready to kind of uh, sell these at a craft fair, and he'd like some tips and tricks for kind of making them a little bit better. I, I have to say straight off the bat, pretty fantastic. Uh, yeah. he, he didn't go to this location he told me to shoot the Aurora. It was just supposed to be a nice starry sky night. A great Aurora showed up. Oh, gee. Uh, that's, I mean, that's awesome. And <laughs> yeah. so he's got these two images. Is this a plane or a con? It I looks like a plane to me. Yeah. Um, I mean, I could be wrong, but yeah. it's just too long, I believe, to be a shooting. But the way it's so bright out at the end. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I'm not sure about that. I'm actually, not sure about that one. Yeah, because plane planes are usually just the little lights, right? Like maybe you'll even get some red if you can. If you yeah, can and usually when you zoom in on them a lot, you get. Um, you'll see the dots as the wing lights flash. And this oh, is so very clean. That is a comet. Yeah, that yeah. is. 
And sorry, actually, I, I don't mean comet. I mean like shooting star or meteor to be. You're right, correct. right. Yeah, because um, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because I was thinking to myself, if that is a plane, I would I would clip it out of there. If mm -hmm. it's a shooting star, mm -hmm. then obviously you leave it. Mm -hmm. um, I think this image is absolutely beautiful. And I love the fact that Adam caught the reflection of the stars in the water. Mm -hmm. um, you know, processing an image like this. Well, what's the what's the uh, shutter speed on this one? Thirty seconds. All right, so I think this is oh, a good you know learning what? opportunity. It it looks great, but um, when you yeah when you zoom in tight, you'll notice that there's movement in those stars. They've they've become little dashes, and uh, I would just say that if you're out shooting a scene like this, um, I'm actually surprised that there's that much detail in the aurora at 30 seconds usually it really blobs out that's a good point too yep better speed yep. but uh you, i think the sweet spot is like that 10 to 20 seconds for really good crisp stars yeah and that's also if the aurora is showing up well enough that's gonna give some clarity to that but i have to tell you that he did an outstanding job on the processing and the way the aurora shows up it looks beautiful yeah, I, you know, I I like this a lot. Um, you know, to get it printed large, I don't think I have a whole lot of suggestions here. Um, you know, a lot of times I play with kind of increasing and playing with the greens and things of that sort, but but this feels very true to life. It doesn't feel overdone. I love the purples and kind of the magentas, or should I say magenta and purple? I don't know which is which here, but um, just that's all pretty nice. Um, I, do, would, I, I kind of wonder though, if there's more red in there than than purple. It's it, there, there may have been a little too much blue put into the post-processing on that. I don't know, do you have a DNG? I don't. I have just the okay. JPEG. Yeah. Uh, just because, you know, there are certain colors that you can make in in a photograph of the Aurora that that don't actually appear. And if you remember, Toby, uh, Frank Stelgus was giving us all the science behind why we see certain colors of the Aurora, how that happens and, yep. and what it is making that. And it's way over my head in terms of being able to remember that and and tell you guys about it but um i would just be really careful if the if in fact those are colors that don't appear in an aurora um i would probably tone that down and get whatever was there mm -hmm. but maybe they did i um i think it looks absolutely beautiful and comparing the two images uh, i think the processing on the second image is a lot stronger than the first one the first one just falls a little flat and then specifically the boats down below just look too crunchy mm -hmm. and it really flattens them out when there's too much detail applied. Yep. Uh, it does look like, I'm not sure what the uh, shutter speed on this one is. Same, uh, same settings. Okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, so I don't, I don't know if this is a before and after maybe he gave us. I, I don't think so. Not based on the amount of, of color and, and brightness yeah. going on over here. Um, yeah. But I, I agree. The there is a crispiness to this one that see, that is a little heavy for my taste. Um, the, the way these trees kind of stand out is just a little too much. Um, yeah. I would back that off. I also would take the time. So you've got either some hot pixels or something reflecting the light in here. Go ahead and those little bits get rid of them because they really will show up when you when you print, uh, especially if you're going to print big. Yeah. That uh, second picture, though, Adam, I mean, huge kudos for catching that. Yep. And I think he did a really nice job. I know the, the, the way we're attacking this is almost more of a critic than Lightroom tips. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, and I, I don't mean to do that, but he is he's going to go to show with these. So I think offering just a little bit of advice for some fine tuning on just making sure that it appears as reality as realistic as possible is warranted. Mm -hmm. uh, Brian thought, uh, wondered what it would be like if you made this a square image um, and just kind of cropped out the boats. And I left that for a moment. I would in Photoshop get rid of that, but let's just real quick for the sake of this uh, speed of this um, somewhere square like that. Y yeah, it's beautiful. There's, there's no question about that. I, I kind of like, the boats for scale and perspective. And mm -hmm. I feel 
when I look at the picture that includes the boats, I feel like I'm actually standing there with the photographer. Mm -hmm. um, when we crop it in, although you've got some land right there, I just feel like I'm looking at more of a two dimensional scene. This makes me feel more like a participant. Yeah. I'm just curious real quick. I'm going to grab the graduated filter tool and drag it up across the bottom. Um, and just exposure and shadows just up a touch. And I'm also going to uh, noise removal up a touch as well. Even though it's a fairly low ISO, um, we do have some noise in the shadowy areas. Just to kind of give a little bit more detail back here, because we have it here. I think you can make an argument that I want um, just a little bit more light in those shadowy areas. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Adam, pretty cool shots. Uh, I hope that gives you some things to think about. Definitely reach out if you want more talking more Q and A before you send those off to print. Yeah. All right. We have Kevin has given us this little um, another one. Pure water, um, like a we call this rock break or wave break or something like that. Breakwater. Is that what you call them? Breakwater. Yep. Yeah. I'd eventually get there after I barked out <laughs> enough words. Uh, let's see, what's this? Um, I wonder where this was photographed. Um, Kevin is actually in the chat room. I, I'm just curious more than anything. I, uh, I really like the way he composed this picture. And I, I'll tell you what I like the most is there is, the, to me, it feels extremely three dimensional and there's a lot of movement in it mm -hmm. um, because of the leading line of the breakwater or the jetty that is playing left to right. But then you, you have the water kind of curves over to the left from the right side and it keeps drawing your eye over to the rocks and I really like that. And then when you hit the horizon, all of a sudden the clouds just shoot out at you. So you've got this whole feeling as you move from the bottom to the top of the picture, like you're moving out way out into the horizon then all of a sudden it brings you back. And I think it's, it's a really cool shot. I think that I would lighten up that center cloud because of that dark spot, if you just step back and really look at it, that dark spot right there is is just staring you in the face. And um, I would tone that down um, to just kind of, you know, match the rest of the, the cloud scene. You still there, Toby? Yep, yep. I was just uh, I was making minor adjustments that maybe were a little bit hard to see. Oh, okay. I, just, I just threw a radial gradient over it and uh, maybe kind of. Yeah, I mean, it can tone, it can um, blend in with the scene kind of just to the upper left from that section, but it was just a bit, uh, a bit dark, a bit distracting. Yep. Yeah, I like this. Um, we could get a, you know, a linear gradient or graduated filter across the bottom if we wanted to kind of bump up saturation to match the uh, sky a little bit here. And remember, you can then selectively change the kind of the color uh, if you wanted to play with that and and uh, have it feel a little bit more reflective. Mm -hmm. That's a suggestion. Andrew's asking in chat uh, when he puts a graduated filter out on the page, why doesn't it come up with the default settings? Typically, it takes whatever is the last settings you used. If you've seen a couple of times now, I drag something out and it's very inappropriate for the scene. It's just stuck on whatever I used it for last. And you can then just pick the one you want or you can hold down Alt and hit reset. That little effect word turns into reset um, and you get it back to zeroed out. Mm -hmm. I think there's some way, I should know this, but I think there's some way to have it to kind of be zeroed out each time, but I'm not sure about that. I always, uh, just as a fail safe, anytime I'm either doing the graduate filter or the healing brush or radial filter, anything, I just automatically click new and then mm -hmm. select what it is I'm going to do. Uh, if I want to reuse that, then, you know, you just go ahead and, um, gotcha. yeah. Uh, hit new and it, and it retains the same thing. I used to use that in my real estate business because I would do some, some lightning on the ceiling and I just wanted to apply the same thing to the, uh, to the bottom and maybe even the sides a little bit. And I would just, you know, keep uh, dragging new radio or uh, uh, linear filters around the image. Yep. Yeah. And definitely I have, you know, I have an eye white and, and a gap Milky Way and a Milky Way. These are ones that I have created and they live down here now in this section. 
there are some that it comes with, like the, I think the teeth whitening and the iris enhance and soften skin, softness focus, but definitely save anything that you think you might want to use again, because it just saves you a bit of time. Yeah. So on, um, I want you, could you do me a quick favor on this one? Uh, yep. Just linear filter down on the sky and uh, you can do it as, I don't know, like a dehaze or color or something, but then go to color at the bottom, uh, bottom right and click one of the, um, yeah, just to warm it up. I want to see, see, I, it just felt a little cold to me. I think that's too much. I think like a, 50 or 25 percent um saturation on that looks nice that 50 percent looks really good yeah, actually it yeah because it still retains some of the blue but you start to see some of the gold that appears from from the the sun that's underneath the clouds and it just gives a little bit more depth and then the the lower portion of the image i would actually um tone down saturation or mm. Yeah, I mean, just so that the the color and the vibrancy and stuff is really part of the sunset story and not so much the foreground. Yeah, all right. So I'm going to hit reset and then tone the saturation down a little bit. Yeah, that'll get rid of some of the blue that's in the rocks, if you notice that. Actually, if you uh, could even go to like HSL and take the blue down or something, but um I don't know. It's just a thought for, yeah, for yeah. Kevin to, to think about. It just seemed a little cool to me. And I think warming it up just a, looks a little bit more relaxing and pleasing. I agree. I think it's nice. Nice job, Kevin. All right. We moved on to Cameron with what is um, quite a beautiful shot. Somewhere right. along Highway 101, I assume. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, that's what it looks like. That's uh, That's cool. Yep. Um, really, I like, I, I don't know, uh, Cameron, if you, you know, framed this or did some cropping here, but I really love, it seems very, very thoughtful. Let me put my rule of thirds on here. Um, we've got this line, the breakwater or the rocks of the beach, uh, starting in that bottom right corner, almost perfectly. And then we kind of hook up with this road and that cement edges of it that just grab our eye and bring us up here to the top left third where we're just left to gaze at the beautiful setting sun, the sky. And then we can kind of come back through the water and enjoy all of this. Mm -hmm. um, really, really well done. Yeah, there's so much to look at and, and you see this and you just stay on it for a while. And that's really what you want to try to do with a story of a photograph is get the viewer to... Uh, just there's so many surprises in this, you know, you've got the the um, tractor down there in the lower right The curve of the road in and of itself is just really aesthetically cool to look at that s curve Yeah, um, the the sunset is obviously gorgeous um, I think if I was to offer some tips on editing I would probably pull this into Photoshop and I would make see the white that's appearing on the far left side that goes off frame Yes, I would just kind of finish that off So it looks like it ends with a little bit of space to the edge of the frame because the way the way that looks is is uh, And you may have it if this was cropped in you may have the, the space mm -hmm. But if not you can you can kind of just fake it and make that look like it ended a little bit more a little sooner than it does and it doesn't just get cut off on the frame yeah um, yeah that's that i agree 100 percent with that just because it's a this brighter white is a little bit more noticeable it grabs the eye just a bit right um, yeah it's it's a very it's a hot spot and so having that just um let's yeah, see let's if see we where. can just kind of fill that uh oops nope not what i wanted to do let's just go to edit content aware fill and uh, using this now, this is the kind of newer portion. Um, it's painted in green where it's going to sample from. So let's be proactive and say, let's make it nice and big and say, no, we don't, don't, don't sample from anywhere up there. Don't sample from the rocks themselves, but all that watery area. Let's try that and see what it ends up with there. <laughs> Well, <laughs> that, wow, that was a dud. Yeah, yeah. Another thing we could do, I, I would try that again a couple of times, uh, truthfully, but we can move over to the clone stamp tool and yeah. just kind of paint in here a little bit and maybe yep. come in from the other side to just kind of try to match that. 
and just have it have it finish exactly yeah. as Steve is saying. And you'll want to do it, you know, um, close enough and and um, non symmetrical enough that it that it looks uh, natural. Exactly. Yeah, I mean yeah. that looks that looks great right there. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I might, it might be, I might uneven that edge out a little bit more, yeah. but I'm pretty happy with it for a quick, yep. Yeah. yeah, and um, I just for giggles, because I got to do it with this picture. Uh, so let me say this with a disclaimer. This is probably a pretty famous spot. And mm -hmm. so what I'm going to suggest is probably not recommended, but I just want to see it visually. And that is to flip the image around. Mm-hmm. Uh, because as it is, the leading lines are all playing more right to left. And uh, I always look for left to right on um, looking through a photograph. But see, now, here's the thing. Like, people that know that road and everything and where it is, it, they'll take one look at that and say, well, that's not, that's been flipped around. They'll know it. I don't uh, because it's not a scene that is familiar to me. But if this was the first thing I saw, I, I personally like that, you know, left to right just feels a little bit more natural to the eye. Yeah. Um, however, like I said, it's probably a scene that people recognize. And so you, you, you're kind of stuck with what you have. Yeah. Doesn't, I don't think that takes away from the photograph. Um, Cameron, I think it's an absolutely beautiful picture. And I'm really glad that you shared this with us. Yeah, it's, it is beautiful. Nicely done. Uh, let's uh, one more from Cameron before we move on. Another nice. Is this? No, I was going to say it's Shark Fin Co., but it's not. No, this is someplace else. Dude, Cameron um, is becoming like our resident um, gorgeous sunset photo photographer. <laughs> yeah, this is awesome. Yeah. So uh, at a one second exposure, I think there was a lot of wave action or. Let's see, one second seems a little short for that, but um, I love this kind of soft ethereal feel here and it contrasts so nicely of course with this really textured sharp rock yeah i would uh if you can without introducing a lot of grain and noise be able to brighten the silhouette around the uh top the first part of the the image just a little bit you know not too much but just enough to see that there is some detail that's in those darks but it's obvious that you're standing in a cave. So there's not this such a huge contrast between, because it kind of went from pure black to um, detail in the rocks on the right and left side very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. And you want it to just be a little bit more gradual. Yeah. So I think what you did there, Toby, looks good. I you know, may have been even just a little too much. Yeah. But again, you have to be careful of introducing noise into the yeah. picture as well. Yeah, uh, but uh, you know that that like frost, not frosted, but that foggy little look mm -hmm. at the bottom is so cool. Yeah, I want to see if I can bring down the brightness. I just did a radial uh, filter there, and if I bring down the highlights, just yeah, just yeah, it's a fine that, line, right? Like yeah. they should come down, I think, a little bit, but it's it's very quickly goes to uh, artificial. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I don't quite like that. I might have tried to be a little bit more careful there, Cameron, but that's getting pretty picky, Cameron. Um, you know, this is this is a kind of brighter region. It'd be nice to have a little bit more texture in that as well. But this, when we talk about high dynamic range scenes from shooting inside a cave, clearly very dark, all straight to the setting sun, um, that's about as extreme as you can get and in, in getting I'm curious if this is one single shot. It is the Sony, which does very well, with high dynamic range scenes. But um, uh, this may be this may be one of those circumstances where you want to shoot a quick bracket that gets you uh, a shot here within the cave that will have all this lit up nicely without too much uh, noise. Because even at, well, this is at ISO 1000, which isn't very high. But if we go up here and we look up at these kind of regions up here, you can see where I boosted the shadows. It does get noisy very quickly. Um, they got those spider webs. Yeah, I know. This is creepy. Brian says it looks like something out of Middle Earth. I agree even yeah. now that I see all these spider webs. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so that's just something to kind of consider and think about, um, you know, even with really good sensors, if you're boosting the shadows a, a good bit at lower ISOs, noise will show up. Yeah, but, and but, um, great suggestions. And 
And this one, uh, kind of as I was alluding to on the last image, uh, the left to right is really working here. You have the S curve of the water, your eye visually follows that, and then that rock uh, formation that's out there uh, on the right side, kind of using the rule of thirds, is, you know, um, compositionally, I think this image is just way cool. It yeah. turned out really nice. Yeah. And Cameron, I hope you keep submitting photos each each week because yeah. I'm really enjoying your work. This, um, I you know, Cameron, I don't know if this was thoughtful or if you got lucky, it doesn't matter, it worked out. I just love that there's enough of this kind of haze and, and wave action here to separate these bits of rock. Um, they're very yeah. close to touching, but they don't. And again, that just helps help us uh, see the depth. If they touched, then we kind of are blocked from kind of accessing the rest of the picture. And uh, just, just really nice. Fantastic. Yeah, and I don't know if Cameron is in the chat room tonight, um, but uh, Andrew was asking which lens. Does that happen to show? Is that a-, a It says name? it's 24 millimeters. And let's look at our metadata and see that it was taken with a Sony 24 to 70 F4. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the heater has just come on. I didn't think about turning that off. So hang on a second. Um, and I think what we'll do is now that we've looked at these fantastic images, we'll look at the crappy punch of my images um, because we want to dive over to um, uh, Luminar and look at that for just a minute. I'm not going to, this great. is going to be a full overview. But so here we are. Um, let me make sure we can all see it um, in Luminar. And if I hit grid view, uh, there, you seeing that, Steve? Yes. Okay. Um, so uh, real quick, let me, a uh, couple of things. Uh, it, we like Lightroom. We recognize that it's um, not the best at everything, but we do, I, I mean, I actually shouldn't speak for you, Steve, but I feel like it still does a pretty good job of being the best kind of organization and editing tool combined. There are certainly better and faster organization tools. I think there are some better photo editors, but as far as just all in one, I think Lightroom does a pretty good job. Um, but man, you know, I've been editing a fair number of pictures the last couple of weeks. I had the model shoot last uh, last Thursday. Um, and, you know, I took way too many pictures of her. She's beautiful. She was sweet. She was patient. She let me take a lot of pictures. And now I have I had like 900 pictures and I was going through editing them and Lightroom was really slow. And this this Mac we're looking at here. What is this? This has got. It's got an i7, 4 gigahertz, 32 gigabytes of RAM. It's uh, The pictures I'm working on are off of an SSD. Oh, no, actually, that's not true. They're not off SSD. And maybe I should think about that um, as part of my slowdown issues. But anyway, so in general, I feel like this should be faster. Um, but uh, it was painfully slow at times. Like I could count to 10 before a picture would completely snap into full resolution. Even though I had it built, I had built one-to-one -one previews when I imported. Hmm. Uh, are you are you seeing what what kind of slowdowns are you seeing? You're working with big Hasselblad files, is, is yeah, yeah. I, I'm it, well. That's a big part of the reason why I've been looking for alternatives to Lightroom. Actually, is because yeah. of the slowdown. And and then I one of the things that keeps happening. So I store everything on an external drive, and I've it's a Thunderbolt three connection. And I actually sent, recently got a six foot cable with a throughput that's as fast as the three foot cable. Um, and so, I mean, that was a big help, uh, just, you know, being able to access the external drive. Um, but Lightroom itself, yeah, when I'm working through, oh, wait, that picture of you flying the drone uh, inside, Light, that's brilliant. That's, <laughs> that, you said a bunch of crappy photos and you have plenty of those in there, but this one, <laughs> this one is great. Um, <laughs> anyway, all kidding aside, yeah, I have definitely noticed that Lightroom just chugs along. Um, and Photoshop does too at times. Um, I don't know yeah. necessarily yeah. why that is. It's I know it's a robust program or if it's riding on the back of Lightroom or something, it's it's details that, like that that I just don't even care to learn about. I'd yeah. rather just have something that's fast. Yeah. Uh, uh, Roger in the chat room says Lightroom's become slower than him. Uh, Kate says hers has been freezing a lot. <laughs> Uh, also, the image turns black and white on occasion, Roger says. So, yeah, you know, I I, I don't mean to bash on Lightroom. I know. Actually, I, I do a bit. Uh, I think that they really, they've heard for years now, at least two solid years, people have been saying Lightroom needs to be faster. And 
We have had some performance improvements, but overall, I feel like it's slower than it was two years yeah, ago. Yeah, and there's a reason why all these other uh, software parties are starting to make a lot of news and, and mm -hmm. gain market share is specifically for that reason. I mean, let's be honest. Adobe has held all the cards for so long, obviously with Photoshop. That's probably not going away anytime soon. But as soon as Aperture was killed off, Adobe just took all of that. And then with the subscription service and our tours and stuff, I mean, we're just saying like subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. Um, Lightroom has just been killing it yeah. numbers wise. But people get into that ecosystem and they get very frustrated as their library starts to build and they've got this slow program or they get these high megapixel cameras with files that are a lot larger than they were just two years ago. Yeah. And you start to see it chug along. And then you got place, you know, like Luminar comes out or Skylum, the stuff that they're, they're introducing or capture one is making huge improvements and stuff. And, you know, there's a reason why people are looking outside of it. I wish that Apple would just bring, they would hire a pro develop team and bring aperture back. God, I missed that program. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it'd be nice. Uh, Final Cut, which I use for video editing, is continues to work really well for me. I'm happy, and it would be nice to see Apple have something else. But then, you know, it's not cross-platform, and and I do love that Lightroom. I we can teach, and boom, you know, everybody yeah. doesn't matter. Yeah. So, uh, so um, you know, and Brian said Lightroom's been very slow for him as well. I, you know, I need to. I'm going to try uh, putting everything on a fast little SSD for a while. Just you know, maybe have a a working drive where I keep a couple of the recent galleries and then they get moved off because it, it is frustrating and a slow experience. And let me just say this up front. I don't think Luminar is ready to replace Lightroom for most of us in the chat based on what I know about you all and what I know about me. Uh, but I th certainly think it is a viable alternative. I love that it's so much cheaper. I mean, Lightroom is basically 10 bucks a month, uh, 120 a year. Uh, this is 60 bucks and they have been very nice in kind of updating it throughout the year. So let's just take a quick look. Here I am in the library and that's this is why we're talking about it right now. Luminar has been around for a while, at least a couple of years, but uh, up until now, it's really been kind of open a photo, work on it, close a photo, and you have your own organization system. They now have this concept of a library built in. And um, I, you know, I'm not working with Luminar on this at all. I, I do... Um, I am in contact with them and I, I'm going to get a little webinar for them to teach me a little bit more. But I will just say that this, uh, if you buy, I think it's 60 bucks right now, they will grandfather you into Lightroom 3, but that ends today, December 19th. So You, know. you mean Luminar 3? Luminar 3, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 60 um, bucks. 60 bucks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, here it, the, I kind of like this, this library view of, uh, you know, not everything's the same size. It's kind of this fun look, um, you know, the pictures kind of fit together in this little theme. You can change the size of the thumbnails up here, make them bigger, smaller. Uh, we have over on the right, we have the library kind of, uh, browser. And somehow I set a camera for 20 to 37, just in case you thought I was a smart guy. I'm not somehow I made all my pictures happen in the year 2037, these 33 <laughs> pictures. Um, but uh, I brought in two folders, uh, Alaska trip, which so I can come in here and uh, the towel model shoot here. And um, I, uh, and they're inside a Luminar folder. So you can kind of see um, all of the pictures that are in there. Uh, and then of course they provide for you this drop down, which is similar to Lightroom of saying, Hey, do you want to see every picture you took on Sunday, December 9th? There it is. Every picture you took on December 13th, um, and recently edited pictures. So there's some neat organization systems that, that are offered here. Um, and somewhere in here, I can say, show me my one star pictures, but now I, oh, it was showing, let's do this. Yeah, showing uh, one stars or more. And voila, showing one stars or more. No? Yeah. Okay. okay. Let's go to all photos. There we go, showing one stars or more. Maybe I didn't have any in that catalog or that section. Uh, and so, you know, there isn't this idea of a catalog either. These files and folders are just living in these drives. I can right click and say show and finder. And then it's, of course, going to pop up a finder window. There they are. But there's a couple of weird quirky things. Like I made this Seattle City folder inside Luminar, but 
but it refuses to show me that it's inside Luminar and it will not let me drag and drop it. But so, so, so that's inside Luminar. Luminar knows about it. There's the picture, but it refuses to let me see it in the correct place. That's a little funny. And so that's, that's questions I want to ask them and be like, well, why does it work that way? Um, one of the things that I really like about Lightroom and that we coach is kind of set up that organization and then use Lightroom and it just makes these folders and the way they look here is the way they really are on your machine. I think there's a lot of value in that. So, but let's pop over to editing real quick to kind of show, or actually before we do that, let's say you, you open a picture, um, sure this wonderful light bulb picture uh you immediately get across the bottom instead of the film strip that we're all used to of other pictures you get uh that picture there it goes you can see that it's not that fast either um and these other looks that you might like hey you want a high key boom one click you've got a high key oh maybe you don't want it at 100 percent. so there is really i feel like kind of a more hand holding friendly click click method and that's why i say I, i'm not sure this is really so much for our group a lot of us we you know we really want to kind of think and be very thoughtful about the editing that we're doing uh, but let's go into the full editor because it is there if we go to the professional workspace over here on the right hand side it looks very similar to Lightroom. We've got our kind of basic sliders. Uh, they're in a different order, of course. And I think, I don't know if you can, yeah, you can drag them around. So maybe that's why Lightroom felt like they needed to add that now. You can change the order, just like Luminar. Please, people, don't leave us. Um, and uh, so a lot of the same here uh, and a few more. But you also have the ability to add filters on top and you have the ability to add extra layers. So um, you can add other things on top or duplicate the image and then, you know, mask out portions of it, which gives you a bit more control in some of Photoshop, which, you know, they do need to let you have that ability because, um, you know, for $60, $60, however often you pay, whatever couple of years, maybe uh, you don't have Photoshop. You only have this program. So, yeah, I don't know. Anything in the chat room, has you said, have you said anything while I've been looking that, that you want um, a little bit more? Um, so. No, uh, well, Brian, Brian Scanlon had mentioned that Capture One is looking uh, good for, for his Fuji shooting. And, and mm -hmm. uh, that is a great way to go. In fact, they've got a Fuji specific version of Capture One that they've rolled out. Um, and I, I don't know how it works, but I remember looking into it when I was trying to switch over and one of the things that they've done that people are saying really helps in how fast it is, is when you bring in photographs, um, it, cr it creates like four different folders. You have the original folder, uh, a work in progress folder, basically. You've got a, a saved final folder and then an output folder. And it automatically creates those subfolders for you. And then the photos kind of work through them. And whenever you're accessing pictures, in a catalog, you're really just working from those four folder systems. You're not, it's not like you're, you're going through this entire universe of your whole catalog to, to do work or to render an image or something like that. It's not working through yeah. this giant catalog. It's isolating these little sections. And, um, and I like that, but, uh, the reason I really bring this up is what I, my second gripe with Lightroom is the color rendering. Uh, I feel like I really need to do a lot to the photograph. I've edited some photos in Capture One, and I'll tell you, I've edited Canon files, I've edited my Hasselblad files, and both of them, I feel like you barely, the, their raw processing, the way they show you that picture uh, right out of the gates is pretty gorgeous. And I found that I have to move things around a lot less to get these just super vibrant, contrasty scenes yeah um, i haven't used it for portrait at all but uh, i've seen it done i've seen some tutorials but for landscape i was totally impressed with the uh and and people have been saying for years that the raw rendering is so much better in capture one than than what adobe's doing yeah but yeah. Uh, i don't know I, I i hear it like we uh we're kind of in the uh, adobe universe and i do i do like it i think it's great they're great programs um, 
but I'm, I'm also doing a lot more in Photoshop these days and I don't think you're going to replace Photoshop with anything. Anymore. Yeah, I know that's, that's, that's the thing. It's hard. It's hard to get away from Photoshop. So we say all these, these other programs, but what the power and functionality that Photoshop provides um, yeah. is pretty serious. But again, you know, I, I use a lot of aspects of Photoshop when I create graphics for the channel and manipulate logos and even do some animation and things of that sort. If you really are just kind of looking at tweaking images, um, then there are some, you know, alternatives that are pretty strong and you can get away without Photoshop, I think. Yeah. Um, which kind of leads into, let's, let's move into some tech barf before we make this show go too long. Um, tech barf is part of the show where we talk about interesting tech bits and, uh, well, I'm going to tease. Not yet. Not going to try to fly it yet. Got to keep watching. Got to hit the thumbs up. Um, <laughs> but first up, we have um, a website. If you don't have Photoshop and you need to separate your subject from the background, we have a website called remove.bg. Um, and I should have squatted on this domain. I should have bought this domain in 1984. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Sorry. Um, let's see. Where am I going? I'm going here to remove.bg. And... Uh, it uh, oh actually removed up eg right here uh you feed it an image that um i should pause my backup too shouldn't i yeah there we go uh let's select the photo i think i have one of uh tau here recently yeah let's try that one right there went out on my instagram the other day so i'm going to feed it this image and it's removing the background and there it does it's done not bad i mm. mean um let's see can we see that better or do we just have to uh, downloaded so let's see what it looks like um here it is larger i have to say stop so you can see my whole screen that's very awkward i'm sorry about that but there we go there it is um what do you think not bad it's pretty impressive actually let's go over to photoshop real quick and i just i showed this the other day but i want to show it again because if you have photoshop go to select subject and Photoshop tries to determine what your subject is. And you can see it's drawn a selection around it, which is very, very similar to what BG did. And of course, we could uh, duplicate that background real quick. Select, inverse, delete. So which one did it better? It's hard to say. I would say... Well, uh Dot BG, you know, captured some of the uh, strands yeah. of color and a lot more of the the reflective red and orange on the top and the right side. Yeah, you're there. right. Um, that's that's yeah, that's quite that's, impressive. That's pretty impressive. So if you're looking to do that, Roger, I know you often are photographing the birds, and then you do some creativity with the background and blur it a little bit. Um, you know, uh, that's it's not bad. I'm kind of impressed with it. So I am remove.bg um you know now of course with the photoshop version you can you know i just took its defaults you could tweak that a little bit if you wanted to which i think is interesting uh and then i we have the story that i teased a little bit are these photographers cheating this is a petapixel article i saw somebody call petapixel the buzzfeed of photographers the other day you remember when buzzfeed used to be like the lit, just <laughs> yeah. barfs and barfs of stuff but you got to give it to them they constantly getting stuff out there and a lot of stuff that are people are talking about um and it's another one of these articles so we're not going to spend a lot of time about it but i did learn something interesting from the comments and um what i learned from the comments is well all right so the the gist of this article is that um if you're kind of a photojournalist or if you're a photographer um, and you set up a shot or, you know, do anything other than just wait for the perfect moment, you might be cheating. And, and uh, one of the other people that they bring up and we love to talk about on workshops often, it's the name everybody knows as an amazing landscape photographer is Ansel Adams. And uh, this is just a great example. I hadn't seen this one of his work. I'd seen others in his workshop a gallery that's there in yosemite but look at this difference here between um what he captured and then his final print Can you see sure. oh yeah. what's showing my face well that's Your horrible point. i'm sorry oh my apologies there we go so a left is captured on the right hand side is edited hmm. yeah yeah so pretty significant difference um and for our editing of landscapes 
I have really no issues with heavy editing. Uh, I mean, you know, I, I, Steve, I don't think you feel differently. No, no, I don't. I, I, uh, this is a great example from Ansel Adams because we reference him a lot. I mean, he's everybody's, every photographer's hero in a, in a certain way. Um, but I mean, I look at that and I'm like, look at what a freaking artist that guy was in the dark room to create. Yeah. Yeah. That is just stunning. And I, I've said to people, you know, for years, like, Ansel Adams took good photographs, but they became great in the darkroom. And here's a perfect example of his talent in the darkroom. And I've always seen myself as a photographer that that edits. I mean, that that's what that's a huge part of what photography is, in my opinion. I, if there wasn't an editing process, I would not be into photography. I, you take snapshots and share it. Okay, that's fine. But for me, as an artist. I I just take all the those ingredients and I like to sit down and make a meal and on my computer and yeah. that's that's where the fun of photography really comes in for me so I'm I'm a little biased but I I feel like that's real photography I think it's been like that for for years and years and years yeah. decades yeah yeah I agree uh, one of the other pieces of the discussion is this uh, I'm actually not familiar with this hope this doesn't make me look like a dumb dumb but this. Uh, the elevator shot, um, this um, elevator girl, and then kind of the rich people slightly blurry leaving. From the contact sheet, you can see that there was a bunch of additional pictures. This wasn't necessarily the spur of the moment. I, I, you know, I, this doesn't bother me. One, you could say that the photographer is kind of setting up, waiting for the moment, getting comfortable with the um, subject. It wasn't like he brought her into this elevator. It wasn't like he brought these people in and completely staged the scene. Where you do have to be careful, though, is kind of when you are a true journalist and you're trying to represent something as, you know, a news source or news, um, you, need, you need to be very careful there in, in how you set that up. Uh, or, or yeah, you know. I totally agree. That's you're, you're playing by a whole different set of rules at that point, in my opinion. If you're a photojournalist and you are in the business of reporting exactly what happened at that moment in time, and it's got to be truthful and it's got to be accurate, then you do have an obligation to present it as such. But if, if that's not what you're doing, if you're wanting to create a scene that came from your mind's eye, what you saw, then you got free reign. Um, yeah. It doesn't, it just doesn't bother me at all. And it drives me crazy when people get wrapped, so wrapped, wrapped around the axle about this and photo competitions and stuff. You know, there's tons of photo competitions out there that you cannot manipulate the image. I get it, but in some ways it's perpetuating this like, you're not a real photographer if you're editing your images. Yeah. I just, I don't yeah. get that. It, yeah. I never have gotten that. I agree. Uh, but, you know, I learned from the comments. I thought this was interesting. This shot, the, you know, this kind of classic bunch of steel workers putting up uh, 30 Rock Rockefeller Center in New York in the 1930s. This is a completely staged shot. They um, were all brought out there. There was apparently a safety platform just a short distance below them. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, this was just, you know, staged to kind of show. Now there were there were other shots taken that day of them pretending to sleep on the rafters uh, or the beams, pretending to play football. And that's not to say that these guys didn't do amazing work and in incredible scary conditions. But th this shot was just kind of put together. So I never knew that. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, and I I think actually if you go back and look at a lot of historical shots that have become popular. And you dig deep enough, you're going to find that there's a lot of uh, staging or manipulation that has occurred. And if you have a problem with that, I mean, I, I okay. <laughs> yeah. But uh, we we owe it to ourselves, especially in a world that we're we're living in today, to do our research. And yeah. you know, the problem comes if you're misrepresenting something. Like you're clearly coming out and saying, "I did not manipulate this whatsoever. This is straight out of camera. I developed it." You know, I didn't do anything in the dark room to it, or I didn't do anything in Lightroom or Photoshop, and here's what you get. And then it's dug up that you, in fact, did. Well, now you're untrustworthy. Yeah. yeah. Breaking news. Roger has tried remove. Whatever is, what's it called? Remove.bg. It doesn't work on birds, and it hasn't worked very well on many of the portraits he's fed it. 
So mm, I guess saying. your mileage may vary. I, that was the first image I tried. It did decently. Uh, well, again, I was super surprised that it did such a good job because uh, anytime you see something like remove.bg, I mean, if there was such a hokey uh, domain name, you know, you know, it's just some kind of cheesy yeah. thing. And uh, to see what it did on the photo that you used as an example was was pretty impressive. But yeah. Uh, and Cameron has come back and said, um, thanks for the tips again. Both shots, uh, this is from earlier when we were in Lightroom, were from the Australia, from Australia on the East Coast. The spiders in the cave weren't as bothersome as the millions of mosquitoes down here in Australia were used to giant spiders. All right, Cameron. All right. Well, yeah. that prevents me from moving to Australia, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> already had issues about moving yeah. to the uh, to the south of the United States. Um, I do not like spiders, and uh, I will be actually in Australia. I will be in Australia, um, April and May, when we just for a layover though. Oh, are oh, you yeah. on that flight pattern too? Like, we're I have not booked that flight yet because I'm waiting on some Hong Kong stuff to follow to, oh, uh, right. to happen. So I probably will not be there in Australia. I'm kind of jealous of that. Yeah, well, um, you guys are gonna have you gonna have some shrimp on the bobby. Is that what they say? Uh, shrimp on the bobby. Um, we'll probably drink a Foster's, which is Australian for beer. However, it's probably not even sold in Australia. Like it's probably <laughs> like when you buy, uh, I don't know, Grey Goose is a French vodka and only exported to the United States. Or mm. so anyway. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm just excited to be able to step foot on the continent and say that I've uh, officially gotten to each of them. Nice. Yep. That is exciting. Um, <clears throat> oh, and, and uh, Tom, Tom, nice to have us, have you with us in the chat. Uh, the flag raising on Iwo Jima was staged as well. And I, I had heard that, you know, it was, uh, it ha it happened, but then apparently the photographer missed it. So it happened again. Um, and uh, of course, then the photographer got at that time. Yeah. All right, we're going to move on to uh, some neat stuff. And again, thanks to Roy for putting all these show notes together. There's a lot of articles we're skipping over because we don't really want you to watch us for six hours. Um, and uh, you can find all of those at photorec.tv slash MMH. That sounds for photorec.tv slash mishmash highlights. Another article, we've moved on into the neat stuff. Is that right? Or are we still in the tech bar? Oh, we're still in the tech bar. Um, an, a $6 Ikea, Ikea pad can help remove stuck lens filters. So it's pretty interesting. And I thought, oh, I have this stuck filter. I can try it. This is not an Ikea desk pad. This is one of those little silicon baking sheets. I have no idea why you would buy one so small. I bought one for when I'm using, I mean, we will make one little cookie, one sugar cookie on here. What are people doing with this? <laughs> I really is that, actually uh, please. Is that this like as a pot holder or something to protect your hand? What I don't know. Here's here's our thumbnail for this show. <laughs> um but I bought this for um a non-slip pad under the platypod. Uh you know, despite Steve always making fun of the platypod and every time he, I bring it out when he's present, uh he makes me feel like less of a man. But great, great product, worst name ever. <laughs> um but it, this works nicely uh, as a non-slip pad underneath of it, and it weighs nothing, and, and you can bake cookies on it, apparently. So, But I have this one step-up ring stuck on my magnetic filter system that's been bumming me out. And it's been sitting here on my desk because I've been uh, meaning to like go upstairs when Chris has a free moment, and we need two pairs of pliers, I think. But then I was like, well, maybe I can do it. But I have not. It's not working. It's not working. You know, so... Maybe we should. Maybe I should buy the six dollar IKEA desk pad because it's bigger. But it just really feels jammed on there. Mm -hmm. Now everybody just thinks I'm weak. So uh, you know, it's it's probably a, a grain of sand or something. No, you're you're not weak because I. It drives me crazy. Every tour that we go on, we're using filters. At some point, we're helping unstick filters. Sometimes six or seven times. Yeah. And um. The, why they can't just that's why i like these magnetic stuff through breakthrough and these these other these other things because why can't they figure out a way of doing those to where they don't stick yeah yeah but then of course if you put on a step up or step down ring maybe you'll get that stuck yeah. but yeah it is true and i do think it's certainly with the cheaper filters that are a little bit more likely to get jammed on or off um i don't know if i have enough data to really support that but i'm just going to throw it out there as i think it might be an issue um, before we move on, let's see if this will take off.
for those who are just joining us late, I have what feels quite heavy right now, the little pocket Osmo underneath the Tello drone. This is a $70 I think, uh, drone. I think you're going to get it in the air, but I think it's going to struggle a little bit. You think I'm going to get it in the air, huh? I think, so. I, I think this is going to go poorly, and I actually want to see if there's something soft that will land on over here. Uh, uh, you go. And, and you know, the problem is the Osmo is like the first thing that's going to hit. You're not... Your your little twenty dollar drone is going to be fine, but that three hundred fifty dollar Osmo. Oh wow! No. That let's was try, let's that try was... one more time just for fun. <laughs> Clearly was... passed its payload. Now, <laughs> if you if you've been watching this show this whole time in anticipation of this moment, I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know what, though? If you've been watching this show the whole time in anticipation of that moment, you got bigger issues than the fact that that thing <laughs> didn't fly. Yeah. Um, How we can hold your attention this long uh, just to yeah. see that is yeah. beyond me. Yeah. But, but there, I mean, I am curious. I certainly could put it on my Mavic. My Mavic would be able to handle it. And why? Why? Mavic's got its own camera because this will do 4K at 60p, which. I really love that look, especially flying. If you half speed that, it's a very kind of smooth, fluid, cinematic look. And so that's exciting. The Mavic and even the Mavic 2 Pro does not give you 60p. It's not and that I think big. They, uh, didn't they do a software update or a firmware update to that thing where it does 1080p at 120 frames per second? Yep. Yep, it does. So I'm going to need to get Archer to jump after his ball or something for that, for that bit of excitement there. And so you can see that it also blocks the existing camera a little bit. You can see there. That's what it sees. Exciting stuff, huh, folks? Thanks yeah. for staying tuned for that. <laughs> Let's move on and um, get into uh, what are we going to talk about? Have I talked about everything I wanted to talk about? Uh, what's underneath stuff? Anything cool there, Santa? I don't. I don't think so. No. No, um, uh, but there is NVIDIA research creating AI that generates photorealistic portraits. So, you know, if you don't feel like taking portraits of people, you can just make your computer generate that. That's interesting. Um, <clears throat> and I will just mention uh, Squarespace uh, is a great place to uh, set up your website. Very easy, beautiful. You can customize it so it doesn't look like everybody else's. Drag and drop friendly. And if you get stuck, they offer 24-7 tech support. They're a great company. Uh, and it's well worth your time. The other thing, you know what's so nice about Squarespace is you don't have those security issues. I am constantly getting alerted. I run a couple of different WordPress sites. I set ones up for friends long ago. And I really regret that now because I'm constantly alerted by plugins okay. that need to be updated. And also on our community site, we just had the other night, like hundreds and hundreds of uh, fake accounts being registered. I had to then take time to put all of that in place. And it's just because Squares, WordPress is, has benefits. I'm, you know, mostly happy running my website on WordPress. It's very easy, but there's a lot of security issues and you just don't have to deal with that at Squarespace. So if you want to, if you want a website building platform that, causes you to literally pull your hair out of your head and um, constantly do security updates and get ticked off and confused because uh, I've been there, then WordPress is your is your thing. <laughs> no, I don't mean to bash WordPress that much because for customization, it, it is actually really nice. But uh, these new programs, Wix, Squarespace, um, are just so easy. They're They're great. And we talk about it all the time. I'm getting ready to redo my site on Squarespace. I'm excited about it. Uh, with the puppy here, it's going to just have to be put off for a couple more weeks, I think. Unless, I don't know, she's, I did some photo editing and she sat on my lap. So maybe she'll be a good website builder. I think so. Just keep motivated. I mean, the one thing that happens to me is when there's a pet on my lap, I'm less likely to get up and wander away. So Yeah, that's very true. I'll Absolutely. If they're sleeping. Yeah, if they're sleeping. Yeah. All right, so let's move into the section of the show that I, okay, I say photos from space. Do you know why I say it like that, Steve? No. Did that start uh, pre-Steve days? P.S. days. Yeah, P.S. Um, I, I just, it, it seemed like that. Remember Muppets from Space as a kid? Oh, yeah. That's what I'm trying to emulate. Maybe you couldn't tell. Okay. That is, uh, I like that. I didn't know that. I get it now. 
And um, I'm actually kind of sorry I didn't get that. I should have. We've, we've dated ourselves as well, though, or at least I've dated myself. So we got a YouTube video from ISA, the European Space Agency. And uh, this is the longest continuous time lapse from space. I won't make you watch all of it. I haven't watched any of it. I'm excited to. Let's just actually skip forward a little bit. Let's see. Is lightning uh, happened on the earth. There's a, a lot of music in my ears. Only. So this would be something to put on your TV, maybe on loop on repeat for a little while. I'll go see if Chris's mom wants to watch this. Oh, that's flying over Guam. It's really just kind of interesting to see this. And I also love that they include this little map so you can get a sense of where it is and um, how far along it is. So how much time does this represent? 1326, 14. I, I'm going to say it represents, does it tell us? Like over did you go all the way around? Yeah, it did. In under 15 minutes, this clip takes you from Tunisia across Be Beijing and through Australia and two trips around the world. The time lapse contains approximately 21,000 images of Earth, and it's shown 12 and a half times faster than actual speed. Hmm. Wow. I wonder, um, wow, the Earth is actually round. This is amazing. Mm, it's all faked. No. Yeah, yeah. And here I thought it was flat all these years. Um, no, this is this is totally cool. I could literally sit here and watch this. I could have this on a loop. So it's a 15 minute video. I could probably watch this for like an hour straight. Yeah. And is it 4K? It is 4K. I'm going to go put this on the TV. Yeah, that's cool. Good job, Isa, Essa. Essa. European Space agency agency yeah um so some people missed this it wasn't exciting all it did was make noise and then tip on its side sorry about that caleb reminded me that i did want to talk a little bit about the z6 um just a little bit i, I have been testing it uh, not as much as i'd like generally i love this camera um, it's form factor, it's control scheme is very smart. It's customizable enough to make me happy. The EVF is fantastic. It's huge and beautiful in there. I love that. Um, uh, but as other reviewers are finding that's continuous autofocus is not impressive. Um, it's just, it's not great. So, uh, you know, moving subjects, I put it, I think maybe a little bit behind the EOS R and I was pretty mean on the EOS R as far as its continuous autofocus system goes. So that's not good, but other good things, image quality is very good. It feels really nice in the hand, I think. Um, and I've been enjoying using it, but I haven't really, other than testing the autofocus can use, tried to focus on stuff. Continuous. So you know, part of what, you know, part of these mirrorless cameras coming out makes me realize is, Sony has really worked on their cameras and I, the A7R 3s autofocusing capabilities. Oh, man, birds in flight. I got some fantastic birds in flight shots in, in the Arctic. And it just locks on and tracks them really, really well. And only when I put the 1.4 extender on or the 2 did it slow down just enough to be maybe start missing some shots up at those faster speeds. And then the A7 III, it's, I actually haven't tested its focusing extensively on things like birds in flight, but in general, it's autofocusing usually is a little bit better than the A7R III. So, um, you know, if you still need an all around camera, those Sonys do seem to be a little bit better, uh, not necessarily better enough that I think you should switch over. I think they'll get these kinks worked out soon. Do I think that it'll seriously improve with firmware updates? I doubt that, but in another version or two, they certainly will be better off. Um, so if you've got a working camera now and you're not dying to have a mirrorless, wait a little bit. If you're dying to have an all around mirrorless, then maybe you should look at Sony. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's my thoughts right now. Um, Oh, Caleb wants to know more. Caleb, I'll think about those questions and I'll I'll answer them um, for you. He basically wants to know how this compares to the newest. Yes, compared to the newest Sony bodies, compared to the ones previous version, ah, it's very similar probably. Um, and then how about compared to something like the XT2? Mm, not quite as good as the XT2, I think, but right, very similar, very similar. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, I mean we've we've kind of beat this. This subject quite a bit. Uh, if you're in the <clears throat> Nikon world, I think, and you want to go mirrorless, that seems like a great way to go. Mm -hmm. uh, 
I think that they did a better job with the Z7 and the Z6 than Nikon did with the EOS, EOS R. If you're in the Canon world, you want you insist on going mirrorless, then the EOS R is is uh, a nice nice way to go. I think it's going to be a, a really great system over time. Um, but I'm, you know, I still consider myself a, a Canon guy, and I'm definitely not jumping on that EOS R anytime soon. I still will say that if I was an icon shooter, I would just want that that D850, do what I could to get my hands on that. That camera is just so cool. It's nice, but it's a big camera. Yeah. It's a big camera, but man, those files are beautiful. They're pretty nice. Yeah. Although I heard, I haven't watched Thomas Heaton's latest video. He apparently was a little bit less than impressed with it, with its dynamic range compared to the 5D Mark IV. Yeah, I saw some uh, little bits and pieces of it. I, I've been meaning to go back and watch the whole thing, though. I yeah. am curious. This, this, I haven't watched it either, so I, I should refrain from commenting. But I'll just say this. After years of experience of trying to be careful in comparing cameras, it's very hard to set up scenarios where you know, in, especially in the real world, um, where you are fairly comparing two different cameras. It's just very, very difficult to do that. And it's very easy to kind of set up and say, oh, I think like Caleb right now asking, oh yeah, the X-T2 at autofocus is like a champ. You know what? I mean, I did this, the A7 III versus the Z6 as a quick test the other day. It was raining. We didn't spend out too much, too long, but I thought that the, you know, the A7 III would blow away the Z6 and it definitely did better, but not as much as I had thought it was going to. So you, we set up these test scenarios, we, we compare these different things, and there are just so many little variables that can bite us and make uh, what seems like a big difference between them when it isn't really. And I, I know I did some careful testing of the 5D Mark IV and the D850 and the D850 dynamic range in the mm -hmm. tests I did was significantly better. So I'm not sure what Thomas Heaton was looking at there, but again, I didn't watch the full video, so I'm not sure what he says about it. So um, one question we're gonna answer from Andrew, he's got a Mifoto Globetrotter tripod and he's struggling to get it, a leg set out evenly. Andrew, my tip for you is to keep the legs all together and extend them then so you know where they are. I basically just, use the little ends, you know, maybe do four of the sections. Don't do three and a half or, you know, something like that. And then they're all going to come out to the same and then spread the legs and set it down. Yeah. And also answers. just make sure you, uh, you look at the, uh, the locks up at the top close to the collar. Uh, mm, good point. That they're, yeah. that they're up against that. Cause a lot of times you spread them out and you set up your tripod and then it seems cattywampus or something, despite being level ground. And I've noticed that, you know, mine's kind of stiff. So you just have to pull the leg out a little bit more, make sure it's right up against the lock on the collar. Uh, that could be, you know, one of the things too. But yeah, just to compare all three of them while they're together, make sure that they're extending to the same length, then you should be, you should be fine. Yeah, yeah. And remember, just a quarter turn. Don't turn, turn, turn. <laughs> just a quarter turn. We say that because on workshops often it happens that somebody turns, they get distracted, and then it's, yeah, it's a part in their hand. Yeah. All right. I think we are done with this show. And as we reminded you, there is no show next week because it's the day after Christmas. We'll all be spending time with our families. And then um, uh, Steve will have to check. I think I'm available. The next show then will be in 2019, January 2nd. Um, you can think about that, Steve. Okay. Yeah, that should probably work. I know my wife goes back to work that day. She's actually uh, tomorrow is I think tomorrow is her last day till the end of the year. She's taking nice. a bunch of time off, so nice. that'd be great. It's it's puppy time, so we need all hands on deck. That's <laughs> awesome, yeah. But uh, yeah, I think that should probably work fine. Awesome. Well, thank you, Steve. Thank you, chat room, for hanging out with us on this uh, Wednesday afternoon or wherever you happen to be. And just a reminder, this is the last show that we have to remind you that our Photo Enthusiast Network prices are going up. You buy in now before the end of the year, you'll lock that price in. Huge amount of value, content, resources, and awesome community. Some of them hanging out with us in the chat room. Thank you. Uh, PhotoEnthusiastNetwork.com is where you want to go to lock that price in. Happy New Year. We should say that. Happy New Year, everybody. Happy holidays. Have a wonderful time with friends and family. Stay in touch. Let me know what you're up to. And uh, follow Steve and I on Instagram if you're watching this and you don't already. Yep. 
Bye-bye, everybody. Thanks for a great year. See you next year. Yeah.